violation right, of male vulnerability, right? Just like right, the man using his power after the woman says no, right, is a violation of feminine vulnerability. And that kind of the recognition that actually men aren't powerful and women aren't victims as a default position. Actually, men are powerful and women are powerful. Men are vulnerable and women are vulnerable. Men lie and women lie. There's masculine shadow and there's feminine shadow. You know, and so I'm going to expand on these ideas a little bit, but I just wanted to offer that up to kind of move out of the kind of theoretical victim structure that you set up and I expanded on to bring it into the realm of actual relationships between the masculine and feminine. It's all yours, sir. Thoughts? Comments? Um, you, you were writing there a little bit. Yeah. The following analogy is not fully true, but it's true enough to be interesting and relevant to what you just said. <clears throat> With every lover, the man grows bigger and stronger. Hmm. And with every lover, a woman loses a petal from her rose. Hmm. 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 Well, that, that's that's. I mean, that's, let's let's that takes us in a little bit of a different direction. So I, I just want to repeat it out loud for myself to to think about it. You know, as you said it. So with every lover, a man grows. Larger, bigger and stronger. Bigger and stronger. Flower opening out to the sun. Bigger and stronger. Okay. And with every lover, right, a woman loses a petal from her rose. That's very interesting. Is that, is that your, your phrase? No, I heard it from someone. Right. Somewhere. It's quite a beautiful phrase. I just want to think about it out loud. And I'm not saying it's, it's 100% true. I'm saying There's a it's moment true true enough to be a counter to some of the ideas that you were just offering. Okay. Okay. So well, let me, without challenging the idea, I just want to first try and understand it. I think you said to me this morning, uh, you called it active listening, uh, which, which is, I'm not exact, but I'm, I hope I'm close to it, which is, I want to first fully inhabit yeah, the idea. Said, yeah. Right, without kind of, you know, blabbing about it, just inhabit the idea. So, I'm just kind of extemporaneous now. So what, what that would mean is, is that there's kind of, that, that a man is, there's, there's a part of masculinity in this, in this kind of, saying aphorism, you know, which kind of, you know, is expansive, you know, is, is, is polyamorous, right, is not monogamous by nature, right, and there's a kind of male expansion, you know, which happens by being with many women, and there's a natural male desire to expand, okay, that'd be the first part. Yeah, in biological terms, I guess they're like populating a village. Spreading seed, right, populating a village, right, spreading seed, right, populating a village. Right, spreading seed, right, populating like a village. male biological kind of a male biological imperative, okay? And, and, and there's also, you know, in, in, in this, again, we're not, we're not talking about its truth or not, we're just trying to inhabit right. the, the, the phrase, there's a kind of expansiveness. At the same time, there's a, a kind of, you know, the Greek goddess Hera, you know, there's about hearth. You know, there's a, there's a feminine hearth quality, which is actually that her full blossom is achieved in kind of, that exclusive and one relationship, you know, with the one man. And that, and that every lover, you know, she kind of loses a petal. Now you understand this for a second, some feminists would kind of kill you on this. Oh, I'm right, right. <laughs> and, right. <laughs> oh my God, what did he say? So, so you hope they're not listening and they don't have your address, okay, right? That's, that's important. But, but, but the, the, the kind of idea that you're pointing out, right, rests on the given that there would be a, there's kind of a difference between masculine and feminine nature. Yeah, and that it's not okay to have mutual affairs with women. Say, say it again, that's not... It's not okay to have mutual affairs with women. Meaning, what do you mean by mutual affairs? Well, you're talking about mutuality rather than consent. Right. And that if there's mutuality in a relationship, then it's not a relationship between victim and powerful, but it's a relationship between equals. And I'm challenging and saying that um, that exclusivity is important to women. Yeah, and that unless unless the relationship lasts a lifetime, um, there there is a there is a power exchange basically to the man's benefit and the woman's detriment, even if it's like a relationship full of all the mutuality of the world. Oh, I, now I see what you're saying. Now, now I see what you're driving at. Okay, now, now I see what you're driving at. So you're saying is, I just want to get, I want to just inhabit it before yeah. I discuss it. You're saying is, 
is that even though, you know, in terms of secular Western ethics, yeah. mutuality means it's perfectly legal, as from a secular ethical perspective, from a secular ethical perspective, it might even be moral, yeah. you're saying nonetheless, you're trying to make a deep one here, nonetheless, there's something essential about the difference in the masculine and the feminine, which means that the masculine's very expansive nature is by itself a violation of some part of the feminine. If the relationship doesn't last a lifetime. The relationship doesn't last a lifetime. So I have to ask you the obvious question here. That's a very powerful statement. right? Um, I have a, a very, very close friend, Dalit, um, who would completely agree with you. Um, completely agree with you. There's, And I think, by the way, the position you're expressing actually expresses the classical Orthodox Jewish position in the relationship very beautifully. Yeah. Right? And I, I, I want to I wanna also kind of say clearly, there's a huge part of me that fully agrees with you. Right? In other words, I, I did not live all of my life that way. Um, you know, and, and you know, I had a kind of deep, complex tug and pull between different positions of this, which I'll unpack for you a little bit. But, but, but the, the position you express, you express the first beautifully, it's a powerful position. Um, you know, a big part of me thinks that that's true. There's another part of me that thinks that's not, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But a big part of me thinks that's true. You know, my friend Zali, who I mean, you actually may meet today, right here in Salt Lake City, completely, I mean, that's, she completely believes in that position. She actually views as her life goal to open a, an entire set of women's blogs to teach that position, right? Um, and by the way, she's the person that was falsely announced that I was marrying. Um, we're very good friends, right? But you know, you know, I think your your friend um, seems to announce marriage as an information which has little relationship to reality. But that's a problem. But what can you do? But anyway, but the least fantastic. I hope you'll get to meet her today. So, so let's no, that, that, so let, let's let's talk about that for a second. So first, it's very clear to both of us that a good feminist is going to disagree with that position. I mean, she's going to say that actually, you know, that's a chauvinistic, patriarchal you know, outmoded male view of feminine sexuality, which devalues the possibility of feminine power and desire, right, being a value by itself, you know, um, which devalues, you know, feminine autonomy, you know, which devalues, you know, you know, all the gains of feminism, you know, and, and, you know, I don't think that bothers you per se, you know, I think you're expressing, you know, very beautifully the, you know, the orthodox position. Um, let, let me just talk for, for, for a moment about that position, you know, because I think that's a, you know, I think you meant that in a personal way, so I'm going to respond to it in a personal way. Um, one of my greatest, greatest life desires, you know, from, you know, the same way that, you know, I, um, we have here? Yeah. Just, sure. no. You know, the, the same way that I kind of tried to, talk about like where your race comes from, right? So I kind of talk, you know, let's self-psychologize, right? Mm -hmm. Right, not just project it outwards. One of my great life desires is for a kind of monogamous great love. That's a huge part of my life, you know, and you know, I spent actually a lot of the last, you know, couple of years kind of looking at that, but I've made you know, significant decisions in my life which contradicted power, career, you know, fame, you know, um, all the external Western values, and which didn't serve, you know, my ability to teach, right, based on that, that desire. I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you, you know, one, one example, when I was 31, much like, you know, the same kind of experience that you had with our waitress, I had, hopefully, it was a deeper experience, but, <laughs> but, but, but it was a person when I was 31, which I thought was true love, and I was right then at the, uh, kind of up movement, you know, in terms of what I wanted to do rabbinically. Um, this is a woman, oh, this, is, this is an example of one of the, the, the sort of stories out there. This whole large story, I had an affair, no affair, nothing like that, but I, I had, um, you know, I had a, a deep love involvement with this woman who was a singer, right, who lived in, a, in central Israel, and, you know, it turned out that she was more in love with love. Um, you know, I thought I was in love with her, but I was also probably in love with love. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, that, that then I was so convinced that this was like the, you know, but, but, but the desire that I was willing to give up my rabbinic teaching at that time, I was willing to give up, you know, an enormous amount. Everything I was. 
right? Every 